Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's long-range technical forecast video brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. This analysis is being provided by perspective only, and any decision made based upon this presentation is the sole responsibility of the person making the decision. Finally, please remember that all long-range weather forecasting is speculative by nature. Well, to start this off, we need to know what this pattern's been doing lately so we can understand where it's going. So I made a map here showing you the 500 millibar height field. So in other words, where we see the cool, color, cool colors, which is where we saw more persistent troughing, and where we see the warmer colors that's more ridging. The time period is basically the beginning of September here through the through the 21st. There's been a, a few very persistent features and things I'm going to be talking quite a bit about is what's going on here just off the Aleutian Islands, what occasionally sneaks through the Gulf of Alaska, and will we continue to see more troughing here over the Great Lakes states because this pattern that we had here produced some split flow across the west and that was of course uh, what helped uh, the fires really get going across the western part of the United States, but also the convergent flow in the midsection of the United States at times produced some pretty dry conditions. But I'll show you exactly how that drier weather kind of came in in just a few moments here. So the big questions we always ask, you know, as we're doing these forecasts is our, our dynamical models, are they doing well? And at times the European model has been quite frustrating. It seems as though it's had a, a, a highly anomalous warm bias to it. But what I'm showing you here is its forecast for the month of September that was given to us at the end of August. And so you can see it did pick up on that trough. It also saw this trough here and it even kind of picked up on the split flow across the west with the convergent flow into this section of this trough. So I, I have to look back and say, well, you know, there were some signals that were pretty clear at that time, and now that I get to look at it in hindsight, I can find them a lot easier. It favored much above average temperatures west, and at times shots of cooler air coming through here with warmth along the east coast as well. But that warm bias really kind of showed up here in the forecast because when we go and look at the September 1st through the 21st uh, average temperature ranks by climate district, well, we can clearly see the warmth in the western United States. The model was biased a bit too warm with what was coming in through the central United States and certainly kind of missed, I think, over here in the east where it had called for above average temperatures at times. Now, certainly because of cloud cover and rain from tropical systems along the east, that's probably the source of, of a lot of that cool the weather that you see there, but there have been a few vigorous cold fronts that have made it through, and we're going to be talking about one, uh, actually three coming through in the next 15 days that we're going to have to pay close attention to. But look how cold it was in parts of Texas compared to average. I remember this is always compared to the 128-year record length, so this is getting down there as a top two or three coldest uh, on record down in parts of Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and southern Kansas. From there, we do remember we did have two pretty nasty cold air outbreaks. The first one over here that was on the left was uh, between the 8th, uh, 9th, and 10th, where we saw a pretty extensive freeze in the high plains, parts of the Dakotas, uh, and then getting up into parts of uh, Saskatchewan and Manitoba there, also hitting Minnesota. And then the second one, which was more recent here on the 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th, we saw cooler weather coming in that weekend that hit parts of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, with frost up the east coast as well. So we've already had in those places frost that's hit the United States and in some locations that would be early. But as we turn our attention now to maybe talk a bit more about precipitation, I want you to watch this animation. It starts on the 30th of June and it's going to go every day from then up until today showing you uh, the top 100 centimeter soil moisture percentile. So 100 centimeters is 4 inches, so this is your top 4 inches. As I play this, we can see a few very uh, key things showing up here. We saw the drought developing in the east first. Watching through here as we go through the month of August, look at South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, Northern Illinois, this area right in through here at the same time as Indiana and Ohio getting quite dry. Then that was all erased as we got into that point in September where that deep trough swung in about all that rain to the eastern half of Iowa, getting into Wisconsin and Northern Illinois. Of course, for many, it was, it was rainfall that was way too late. But uh, elsewhere, we were watching down here. Uh, multiple systems went through this part of Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Louisiana, bringing in heavy rain. And our most recent two tropical systems, Beta, the one that's going on now, and then Sally, last week, cut right in through here, really bringing in a tremendous amount of rainfall. From there, I would like to show you for September so far what the precipitation ranks look like. And we can see the effects of those tropical systems. And of course, these numbers in through here will be coming up as we finally see what beta does here. Uh, but that heavy rainfall from that cutoff low, remember the one that came in like this and then took off toward the Great Lakes? It's amazing to see this huge recovery in moisture, although it did really, for the most part, nothing to, to kind of cure the problems that we had from the drought that set up in August and early September in that area. It has been quite dry in 
the northern plains has been very dry in the northeast, although Teddy is uh, up here now, uh, was bringing in some scattered uh, showers and some stronger winds and very rough seas. But if you look off to the west, uh, it's been extremely dry uh, out there, and that's been a continuing problem for a while and something we're going to continue to see in the near term here. So I, I've got a few things overlaid on this figure, but I look, look at the thing in the back first. That is the current ocean temperature pattern. Uh, most important, I think, thing at this, at this juncture has been what's going on right here with our La Nina. As you can see, it has been strengthening, and the blue line in the graph in the bottom really kind of indicates that. We now have our values down here almost to a full degree Celsius below average, and so this is a robust La Nina. Now the implications of this are partly responsible for what we've seen in the behavior of the jet stream that's affected North American weather. And I'm going to take you over here to this embedded figure on the left to explain what I'm talking about. It is a graphic here of vertical and zonal integra uh, integrated, so the integral of total atmospheric angular momentum. Now, what does all of that mean? Well, we'd like to know where the atmosphere is gaining momentum and where it is losing momentum. And this is res with respect to a flow that comes from the west to the east. So we know that during uh, La Nina's we have strong trade winds, right? So this right in through here, whoops, let's draw that in black for you. That right in through there is the momentum loss in parts of the tropics due to this developing La Nina. In other words, our stronger uh, uh, trade winds in that area. And we can see that it's kind of fanned out going toward the north and some to the south here and pulling through the, sub, uh, the subtropics into the, the polar latitudes. And again, I'm talking about here like 30 degrees north to 60 degrees north. And that is part, I think, of the reason why we're seeing the pattern evolve the way it is as we finish September and begin October. I could be honest with you, I, I could probably spend a month trying to look at all the intricate pieces that are playing together this time of year to give us this pattern I'm about to show you and, and to tell you which one is most dominant, I'm gonna have a lot, I'm gonna have a really hard time doing that. But here's what I do understand. You see, going back over the last week, so this is the 14th through the 21st, the jet stream was coming in like this into the Gulf of Alaska, so there's a trough here. This was that split flow that I was telling you about. We had a subtropical piece of the jet stream here, although it was weak. We then had this high at times that was sitting here. The jet stream split around in the upper levels of the atmosphere. And then it converged in the midsection of the country before diving here into the North Atlantic. So as a result of that particular setup, this is how much rainfall we've had uh, over the last uh, a week or so. Each time a little cutoff flow sneaks into the Pacific Northwest, it's bringing in the chances for precipitation. But still, the flow has been relatively weak, I think we'd say, in the Gulf of Alaska, despite these troughs coming through. Where the convergence happens, you can see right in through here, it's dry, and it would have been drier farther to the south had Sally not gone through here, and now Beta came into this area. We had a much, much drier eastern half of the United States if those two tropical systems would not have raced through that area. And yes, they put down some extremely heavy rainfall on their way through. As we see this forecast moving forward, let's just stick with our theme here on the jet stream. You notice that as I just take you out the next couple of days, this is Friday. Look at how zonal the flow is across the Pacific. That means west to east flowing. You see going from here out to day 10, now the jet stream instead takes on a much different path. Look at how much more amplified the flow becomes as you get downstream. So something has kind of tr triggered this to go into a much more meridional north-south flow than it has than it than it's going to be here in the near term. And is it something going on over Asia? Uh, is it something going on with the loss of momentum in the tropics? Does it have something to do with the MJO curling through phases four, five, six? It's a combination of all of those things, but the result is that over the next few weeks, this ridge building to the to the west here and the trough diving out of the, the, the northeast here is going to be a significant part of our flow and seems to be the way things are going to be uh, kind of moving as we go forward here. So kind of keeping that in the back of our minds here, I would like to show you what this is going to do and the most important players as we look in this longer term. Here's our next trough cutting through the Gulf of Alaska. As I play this forward, you can certainly see that that trough pushed through the Canadian prairies and then dives here into the Great Lakes. And what's supporting the depth of this trough is the fact that there's a reinforcing upstream trough coming off of the Aleutian Islands once again. So what does that do? Well, those troughs dig and in between them a ridge builds. I mean, this is a pretty solid and robust pattern that is one that will tend to become blocked. In other words, not move much over a time period of maybe five, seven, ten days. And as I get you out here to the beginning of October, this seems to be the way the atmosphere wants to shape up. In fact, I'm all the way now to October 5th. 
and 6th. And we still see the evidence of a trough somewhere here between the Aleutian Islands and the Gulf of Alaska. And then something here extending from the Hudson Bay down to the southeast with more ridging in the western United States. And if that's the pattern that we are going to see set up, well, as that trough dives in here, watch, coming out of the Canadian prairies, there it goes, Saturday into Sunday, Monday. Yeah, it cuts into the northeast and brings in the precip. But other than that, you see this narrow band in through here? That, which possibly gets into the eastern Corn Belt and then into the northeast, is about it. So it's coming out of the prairies and cutting through here, which means if you're in this area, the probability, I know I'm kind of just drawing here with my, my cursor, but that area probability of there being precipitation is quite low. And remember, this is all from beta coming in through here. Now, we do have to ask, is the, are the tropics going to continue to be active? And I'll, I'll make a case for why I'm going to watch Bay of Campeche, parts of the Gulf, but the Caribbean here in a few moments. But if you just compare what I just showed you to normal, well, where the trough initially digs into the northwest, it's going to be wet, and we might even get some rain into the Columbia Basin. But it's going to be right in through this corridor here, spreading out into the eastern Corn Belt. I think we're going to get some rain in through this area, then pulling to the northeast. And again, this is what's left over from beta when you look at this 10-day forecast. So if we remind ourselves what things will look like at day 10, the, the, the pattern both in the GFS and the European are both consistent with a ridge here and troughs in this area. And I can almost count like a, a four wave pattern. Do you see it? There's ridge, 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 and then there are four troughs. And so is that pattern going to be a longer wave pattern and therefore resist change? Or will there be a few more features that can help move this along? Because as you look out exclusively, exclusively excuse me, into week two, the European model through October the 7th has a very dry pattern forecast here for much of the United States. And the GFS, which is over here on the left, and by the way, I did get the 12Z GFS into this forecast video. The European still a few more hours away from, from running before I could, uh, and I had to get this recorded. But I do want to make the point that this is an area that the models keep consistently want to produce something out of the tropics. But remember, if the flow pattern's like this, the odds of getting something to come out of the tropics and cut through that trough and get into the eastern part of the United States, that's very hard to do. In other words, these synoptic scale jet stream winds would take anything that develops here and just race it on out to the open Atlantic, which is why we're seeing some suppression of our tropical season right now. So just giving you an idea here, this is what the next five days looks like from the National Hurricane Center, and they don't have any new development here, the Caribbean or the Gulf. So it's just Teddy, which is going through the Canadian Maritimes, and Beta, which is going to be very slow, but move toward, you know, the Carolinas and Virginia by the weekend. Other than that, well, the upper levels of the atmosphere are a bit in a, a suppressive mode uh, over Africa getting into the open Atlantic. And that's partly due to where the MJO is currently sitting. See, back in August came through phases one and two, and then as September began, it got into three, four, and it's kind of sitting in this area, which is phase four and five is giving us good upper level support here. And that's partly why, you know, if you just think about the atmosphere breathing, we've got some suppression in these two areas with more rising motion here in between. So this seems to be the way the MJO is affecting things. Now let's turn this over to a discussion on temperatures. I'm just going to play this for you. I want you to watch the pattern. This is every day for the next seven days. Here's Wednesday's highs, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Now watch as we get into Monday and Tuesday. That's when the pattern gets established with that broader trough over the Great Lakes and the heat returning to the west. You can see the temperatures really skyrocketing here. And because this pattern, I think, tends to stay in this configuration for a while, uh, this is what we end up getting here from the 6 to 10 day forecast from both of our major modeling centers, the GFS left and the European right. And, and that would be very consistent with that pattern, right? And you can, you can see it in both models a little bit, oops, sorry, you can see it in both models, a little bit different projections here, but it's the same idea in the flow here. And this is what things look like days 11 through 15. So my problems here for the West, this is going to once again um, be a pattern that is more conducive to uh, fires and heat uh, and dry conditions and at times even windy. And while we're over in the east, um, we're going to have to just watch out for each one of these shots of cooler that come through as to increasing our, our probability of, of getting a frost. Um, at this point, it's nearly impossible for me to nail down in that longer range time period how far to the south we might get a freezing temperature. But I, I want you to know that I'm watching it. So we now do what we did at the beginning. We say, OK, well, what are the models saying for October? The models, uh, what you're looking at here is the flow through October 21st. And you can see how persistent the model is with that trough coming somewhere between the Aleutian Islands and the Gulf of Alaska. So if you just kind of follow the flow of the atmosphere, it's doing this. 
And a question I have over here on the right is the seasonal forecast, which means the monthly forecast from the European, really wanted to paint a big ridge here. Remember me talking about it for the last couple of weeks. Now, we clearly know that that's not gonna develop at the beginning of October, but will it develop toward the end? That, that's a question we're gonna have to be watching and, and trying to answer. Because if it does, then that would lend to a warmer October. At this point though, what I really wanna stress is over the next month, so from today through this point in October, the probability of being wetter in the western, northwestern, excuse me, the northwestern United States is higher. We've now seen both the uh, European and the CFS V2 paint a corridor in through here over to drier conditions, which means this will really, I think, push along harvest quite quickly. And this map right here does include beta. That's why this area in through here looks so wet at this particular point. To continue on this idea, if there's some multi-model support in this, what I've got for you next here is from the CFS V2 model, but we're only looking at week three and week four. So this is October 7th through the 13th, then the 14th through the 20th. And can you see how both models during that time period do want to keep the midsection of the United States and even parts of the east over on the drier side of things? And this model also wants to keep a lot of that heat to the west as well. And I'll be honest, I think in the last three weeks, the CFS V2 has been better at week three forecasting than the European has at picking up on this pattern, which again favors cooler weather to the east as we look out here uh, to the, the third week of October. So uh, piecing together again uh, th these components is, is quite challenging at this point, but certainly La Nina is one of our dominant signals, something that's going to be around for quite some time. Tomorrow morning I will be addressing the drought issues we're experiencing in parts of the Black Sea region, including the Russian wheat belt. And we'll also talk more about uh, rains for South America, so look forward to that forecast coming out tomorrow morning. But until then, we've got a pretty dynamic pattern to be watching here across the U.S. and Canada as we progress through the month of October. And again, if I just had to put a point on it, I, I'm going to stress once again that the models are at least favoring a drier harvest, and that is certainly different from what we've seen in 18 and 19. So I'll go ahead and wrap it up right there, and thank you for your attention today. Have a good one. Thanks.